Hey everyone, Riley here with Dark Arrow. We're in the shop and I want to talk about this, the Dark Arrow 1 prototype. We've got the whole airplane assembled together, at least the airframe and kind of the basic shape of the aircraft. Uh, up on the landing gear, let's take a look at it. In the last video we showed off the fully assembled airframe of the Dark Arrow 1 prototype, but that was just kind of a teaser. In this video I want to talk about what we built up here and also answer some of the questions that came out of the last video. The biggest question that we saw was just, does this thing fly or when is it going to fly? Uh, it's going to fly later in the spring. We're not ready to fly yet. There are a couple tasks remaining that we have to finish up before we can get this thing in the air. I'll talk about those in a second. First, I want to talk about some of the most recent progress, which was the main landing gear, getting those built up and installed in the airframe. We spent most of 2021 last year working on landing gear. There were some other projects, but main gear and nose gear were kind of the big theme of the year. And the culmination of all that work was getting it, uh, getting the gear installed and getting the airplane on the gear at the end of the year. A big question that came out uh, in that last video was just kind of an inquiry around the geometry of the gear, thinking it looks a little bit unconventional. So the landing gear slopes forward uh, relative to where it's mounted. And the whole reasoning behind that is we're trying to achieve a specific weight distribution on the gear, and that's critical for having acceptable ground handling characteristics. We're trying to have about 80% of the weight on the main gear, 20% on the nose gear. If you have too much weight on the nose gear, it's difficult to uh, rotate the airplane on takeoff, and it's also a little bit difficult to steer. And then if you have too little weight on the nose gear, it can basically tip over on the tail for a, a tricycle gear configuration like this. And then having the struts angle, that's dictated by where we can actually mount the struts in the airframe. There's either uh, structural limitations or uh, space claim limitations that determine where these can mount. We can't run them straight vertical because the occupants of the aircraft or the cockpit is pretty much right above the wheels. And uh, same thing with the, the nose gear. We can't run the nose gear strut straight vertical because the oil pan for the engine is there. We have some remaining work on the main gear. We have to install the brake line, so as it sits right now, we don't have any brakes. We also have to build and install the retract mechanism for the main gear. We have the retract mechanism built up for the nose gear, and the, the main gear retract mechanism is very similar. And then we also have to build the, the gear doors and the closure mechanism. Technically, we could fly without gear doors. First couple flights we'll probably do without even retracting the gear, but uh, gear doors are a remaining task. Kind of a cool observation I want to point out now that we have this whole thing together up on the landing gear. You might notice it's sitting a little bit nose low right now. There's some compression in the nose gear strut, but then not as much compression in the main gear shocks. That's because the airplane's empty. There's less weight on the main gear when, it, when there's no one, when there's no people inside the airplane or no fuel loaded in the fuel tanks. But as soon as we start to load it up, that weight ends up coming over the main gear and the CG of this whole assembly starts to shift aft. When that happens, the main gear will compress and this will kind of go into more of a uh, level attitude or even slightly nose high. We predicted that in the early phases of the design, but it's kind of cool seeing it play out here in the real world. Uh, we still have to kind of dial in the exact pressures that we want in the shocks. Uh, we picked a, a starting point pressure that we thought was pretty close and it's, it looks about right, but through a little bit more testing, we'll refine those pressures to get it exactly the way we want, but it's nice seeing that uh, our starting point is at least aligned with what we predicted. Another remaining project that we have before we can fly the prototype is finishing up the canopy. So the canopy that we have installed right now is one of our, our scrap canopies that we made in-house. If you've been following our channel, you know that uh, we spent a lot of time messing around with trying to make our own canopies and develop that process in-house. Ultimately, we ended up outsourcing it and we got a proper final version canopy from a supplier that we partnered with. We got pretty good at making canopies that were the right shape, but the optical clarity was unacceptable. So if you look at this one, you'll notice there's a little bit of optical distortion or a lensing effect when you look through it. So we're gonna swap this out for one of the proper uh, final version canopies. There's also a little bit of structure that we need to add, kind of a roll cage or a roll structure that uh, gets added into the aft end of the canopy, as well as a, a ceiling solution that goes around the perimeter. And then we also have to finish up the hinge mechanism and the latch mechanism for the canopy. So that's all coming kind of in parallel with finishing up the landing gear tasks. One of the repeat questions we saw in the comment section of the last video was in regards to the cooling air intakes on the cowling. 
Uh, there are co some concerns over the size, whether or not we'd have enough uh, cooling airflow to, to keep the engine adequately cooled. So uh, without getting into too much of the fluid dynamics, it's actually the size of the exit on the cowling, which is on the belly of our aircraft, uh, that dictates the amount of airflow through the, the cooling system. The inlet dictates more of where the deceleration of your airflow occurs, as well as the velocity of the cooling airflow through that opening. Uh, we can iterate on this opening if we do decide that we want to mess with this. We can cut this opening larger and then right behind it we have a 3D printed intake diffuser which uh, spreads out the airflow and slows it down before it heads through the cooling pins on the engine. So we can just swap out that diffuser for a different one. It's pretty easy to 3D print another one. So it's easier to make uh, an opening bigger than it is smaller on this cowling. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out as far as uh, future work on the firewall forward package, no one seemed to point out that we're missing our, our ram air intake for the engine so that the engine can breathe, as well as the opening for air to enter the oil cooler. We have a, a separate dedicated air cooling system for the oil cooler on this engine. So that's future work we need to do on the engine. Another thing I wanted to speak to, uh, as long as we're talking about power plant and firewall forward, a couple of people asked about why we're not doing an electric propulsion system on this aircraft. Uh, the Dark Air One is specifically set up for high speed long range missions, so we could potentially do the high speed component of that mission with an electric propulsion system, but the long range uh, simply is not possible with current battery technology. There's limitations on uh, battery energy density, which is going to limit your range, and it looks like it's going to be like that for some time. So for now, uh, conventional old school combustion technology is still the best that we've got for achieving a long range mission in a light aircraft. Another repeat question we had was in regards to the rudder. We did a whole dedicated video about the rudder, which I can link in the description of this video. I also wanted to talk about just a couple things we learned in the process of assembling this whole airframe and engine assembly. Uh, this was the first time that we put the engine on the airframe with the airframe on the landing gear. That was a little bit different than what we've done in the past. So uh, for the latest iteration, we used an engine hoist to put the engine on the airframe. Previously, we'd been doing it by plucking the engine by hand and installing it on the airframe. So we learned some things after doing it for the first time with an engine hoist and learned some things that we want to improve to make the process easier for builders. Uh, we also got to confirm what it was like just rolling the airplane around on its landing gear, on its wheels. So it's actually really easy to roll. I can push it around with one hand. It's pretty light in this configuration. You notice you hear that tire scrubbing noise, uh, the wheels on the pavement. It sounds kind of squeaky like that. Uh, that's because the tires are canted in slightly, so they have a toe-in angle. That's for better ground handling characteristics or better uh, stability when you're rolling down the runway. And because they're angled in a little bit, they actually scrub a little on the pavement of it, and that makes that squeaking noise. So we actually measured the tone angle and confirmed that. We had that all designed in the CAD world, but it's nice to confirm that in the real world once we built this whole thing up and see that that toe-in toe angle is actually there. And then you can also hear it when it squeaks on the pavement. I think that's about all I wanted to discuss with this whole assembly for now. We'll have more videos documenting uh, the remaining tasks we have to do before we get this thing flying. We'll leave it at that. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next video.